Karibuni sana, the listeners, to a Kenyan episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations today. We're here with Sarah Nianchera, who also has her own podcast called The Vulnerable Scientist. And yeah, welcome. Karibu, Karibu sana, Sarah. Santi, Santi sana. And yeah, please, um, yeah, feel free to introduce yourself. And um, as we get to talk, about your podcast and how that started and the kinds of stories you share in interviews you do. Um, what brought you to here? What is your journey so far? I hear you're also a researcher yourself. So that's where the yeah. science connection comes from. Yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Sarah Nyakeri. I, Sarah Nyanchera Nyakeri. I am a MSc fellow at ILRI, International Life Cycle Research Institute, where I am studying um, vaccines. I'm looking for new vaccines for a pleural pneumonia that affects cows caused by mycoplasma. I'm also a student attached to Jomo Kenyatta University of Agriculture and Technology. I'm also a podcaster, um, four months in. <laughs> into podcasting and uh, I'm loving it I think I've been thinking this is the the path that I want to take I'm not sure yet but I'm loving it so far but anything science communication I guess yes informal science communication mm. and why why do you think that's important or what's so what's so exciting about it Um, I think it's important to communicate what we do in the closed spaces of the labs. I think it's important for scientists to communicate that to people around them. Most of the time you find that f sisters or family members don't know what their family member is doing in the lab. They, it's hard even those conversations don't really happen unless it's just a by the way or unless corona has come and <laughs> yeah. you, that's the time people actually are interested to know okay or they they have a question related to maybe a medical something and they want an answer to that that's when they have those conversations but a day-to-day -day activity of telling people what you actually do people don't really understand at the same time scientists are not as comfortable uh, most scientists are not as comfortable to do that so if it's so difficult to have conversations about science with people who are, you are close to how about the public how about the other people who we are doing the science for we are doing science for farmers you're doing science for people looking for new vaccines or diagnostics but we don't tell them this is what you're doing and when you finally come up with a technology you want people to understand what you've done and why you, what this technology you've brought up uh, will help them and how it will help them it's it's hard if you if you haven't taken through them that journey and let them understand what is this thing mm. and for me that is why I try to help first scientists to communicate their own science through the different mediums that I use. And also it's, I'm very passionate to tell the public what is happening in the science spectrum. Mm. Yeah. And in your area of research, um, like with research um, topics around cow or cattle diseases, your stakeholders would be farmers and cattle breeders, also Maasai, because they're known to be custodians of, of the cattle that eventually in Kenya also provides for, well, a percentage of the meat industry, right? Yes, yeah. Um, I've actually been thinking recently, honestly, now this is just being honest. I've, I've been thinking recently, I need to, talk to someone who is in the farming of cows and things related to that. I have friends who do that, but we don't really 
uh, and we have conversations, of course. I always talk about what I'm doing mm -hmm. to anyone who's interested to hear what I have to say. Uh -huh. <laughs> But uh, I would like to, you know, come into contact with the big, you know, um, farmers when it comes to livestock. And I think that would be a great motivation for me when, especially when I, when I come across hurdles through my research, it would be a great motivation for me. Um, but again, uh, I have colleagues who have family members who are, are big farmers mm. in, in terms of livestock mm -hmm. and there are certain diseases especially goats uh goats and cows uh, this pers person is farming i wouldn't really say the specifics um you'll find that they're having trouble their their business is going down and you'll find that this person is stressed and if your brother is stressed about something and they know you're actually in that spectrum of looking for new vaccines they will always have those conversations and it will trouble you right and uh -huh. that troubles everybody across so apart from it um being about looking for new solutions to problems it, it is also a, a, a personal issue to to most to other people and or to most people like um they want to find a new solution to for something When I came to this project, I wanted, I, I saw this project being advertised and I, th I, I thought to myself, I mean, you, you, I, I mean, you, you mean that there's no vaccine like <laughs> for this disease that is like, you could see the map of Africa. It is capturing a very huge percentage of Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Like it is endemic like in 12 countries mm. and it's majorly just Africa and it's an African problem. And I was like, seriously, there's no vaccine for this. And I was like, I need to be part of that. I need to, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing to, to do something and you know that the result will affect, um, will, will, nicely or positively affect someone it's it's a nice thing to be part of of course this is a vaccine but it's um it's not as effective it's very low efficacy sometimes it becomes virulent and farmers are not happy about that but you i, I got you uh, emotion about it like it's a, it became a personal problem for me so mm. that's why i do what i'm currently doing and that's the motivation that i have to do the project that i'm doing though it's tough <laughs> Yeah, no, it's a great motivation to have. I think many, many of us researchers have like, or see a purpose or at least develop a purpose with the work that we do at some point. Sometimes we can't see it from the beginning, but then the more we dig into the topic, we see how things are connected and interconnected and how we can actually have an impact with providing a puzzle piece to, to the bigger picture. It's yeah. funny because I actually have a Kenyan friend she forgot this town but well, she lives in the Masamara and she's also from a cattle herder Maasai tribe and she told me that it's probably right I'm asking if this is the same disease she's been talking about because it turns out that uh was it camels or some other species or the wilder beasts, rather. Well, camels are not native to Kenya, but but wilder beasts but are. I think the wilder beasts are also cattle-like, and they seem to be immune to that virus. Is that well, the virus that they're struggling with? Maybe it's the same. So whenever was it the other way around? Oh, when the wild beast comes and they don't get infected, but then they can transfer the virus to the cattle. I think that was the issue. So, mm -hmm. and then the cattle with the Maasai, they are roaming free, so they're not fenced. And they can't and don't want to fence the cattle, but that's an extra threat. And, and they were also hoping for somebody to develop a vaccine so that they wouldn't lose so many of their livestock. Um, and the the virus spreads like twice a year and only when the wildebeest calves around that time, that's when they're transmitted. Mm. 
But maybe we're talking about a different virus there, but I'll introduce you and then you can do your expertise exchange. <laughs> I, I love that. Though whatever I'm working with is a, it's a bacterial disease and it's the only bacterial disease that is notifiable um, if it occurs somewhere, like you have to notify the international space Mm. And you can see what that does to business. If like, if mm -hmm. people are, are afraid to, to report deal it. with me, yeah, to deal with me because I have this disease in my farm or in my oh, country, okay. you know, then trade is impossible, you know. And doing trade in between countries, like in terms of beef and anything related to um, to cattle mm. uh, produce then the farmer suffers the economic <laughs> there's an economic strain there you know sure so um how how did you get to okay you basically already told us how you're interested in this kind of research what was your journey um towards that to your master's program now um I, when, when I was young, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, but there's a time when I was in high school, I had a list and in that list, I had a very huge list, but in that list, I remember I wrote somewhere, I would like to be a scientist. Hmm. There was a scientist, journalism, architecture, other things that are a very long list of the careers that I was interested in. And I remember, I didn't know anyone who was in science, but I was really interested to be a scientist. Um, and when I got into university, I really didn't know that the career that I chose would make me a scientist. I just, I just did not knew that I didn't want to be a doctor, <laughs> and I wanted to be an architecture, but I, I wasn't chosen for that. So, when I was chosen for biochemistry, and I was like, okay, so what do you do with this career? What do you do with this <laughs> biochemistry thing? Um, that's when I. Uh, I sort of been curious and sort of going to, into labs and trying to see, okay, so how can I use the skills that I'm learning in school or what, what are the practical aspects of it? And when I did that, I was in a kind of an educational system. I was first um, interned in an educational system where I was just the lab assistant helping with the practicals of pharmacy students. But there was this student who was doing her master's and she had, uh, she was busy with her other stuff. She was a teaching assistant, but she would come and she would leave me with some responsibility to do with her research. And she was doing something to do with um, using how to use bacteria to clean uh, the oceans the, uh, from oil, like if there's a spillage and all that, and using oil as a carbon source. So I found that exciting, like, you're doing research that will actually help. And that's, I think, the first interaction that I had, uh, one of the first interactions that I had with research. And there's this other research that where someone was um, was doing their PhD research in my institution, and they, they were doing research on CAT. I don't know if you know Mira. There's this. Yeah, I, well, I know, but maybe should explain to some of the listeners. OK. Oh, you want to explain? Please, please do. It's like a, it's like a, is it a herb, like a plant you can chew and also get some, it's like a, it's not really psychedelic, is it? Or a little bit, or more like caffeine, so it keeps you awake and, and um, excited and people can stay awake, what well, keeps you awake and, and up and running. So people have yeah. to work a lot and long hours or and to be in a good mood, they should. Yeah, yeah. It's a pretty bitter stuff, I hear. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. Never tried um, it, of course. Yeah, I've never tried it. I would like, I was curious, but I've never. Huh? Um, so, there is this guy who was doing research related to that, and he was trying to find out uh, its effects on the kidneys and the brain and all that. And I was, I helped him for a while to do, you know, he was doing that, the study on mice. And I was helping with the, 
you know, in giving the mice the cut, you know, processing the cut, then giving the mice the cut. And... But they were injected, it, they didn't chew it, right? No, no, it's just, I, I used to make it into um, a juice. Oh. Yeah, then, you know, you change the ratio depending on the animal and mm -hmm. now you give it. So every single time you, you'll give it the, because it's oral, so normally people take it orally. So I used to, you have to give it oral to introduce it orally. And um, at first, of course, the mice were resist, were, were annoyed, but after some time they came to like it. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I never stayed on to find out more of what he did. But when, when I went home, because I come from the kind of ghetto side of um, of Kenya, when I went home, I would interact with my friends who I studied primary with, who most of them went into uh, doing business and all that. But there's a chunk of people who are doing drugs, uh, and one of the legal drugs that they were doing <laughs> was this cut. And I would, they would ask me, what are you doing now? Uh, since you used to be bright, no, what are you doing with that brightness? And I'm like, oh, I, I actually am in the lab right now and, and I'm doing this and this and you excited just talking about it. And they were so curious to know, okay, so what have you found out? <laughs> <laughs> um, seeing how impactful the research that I had been involved with was having an impact, a potential impact to the people around me or the community at large mm -hmm. made me want to be part of research. And seeing that you're not doing necessarily uh, the same thing every day made me more excited. I was very, I was very inclined to diagnostics at first and when i was trying to look for opportunities i couldn't get that then i'm thankful that i wasn't able to get that because most diagnostic um, work was just routine lab um but i i saw how i can actually look for diagnostics for an uh, the in african infrastructure like diagnostics that can be applied in the African infrastructure. And that's what made me now start to look for research opportunities. Mm -hmm. And while going round and round looking for different, uh, what are people doing? How can I get myself involved? And this is what I'm, I was very specific. I wanted to be involved in diagnostics. And it was hard to, to get a position in that. And someone told me, you know, um, you can learn these other skills that you can apply to still the diagnostic research that you're so passionate about. And that's how I, I got myself into vaccine research, actually. Um, I, I saw this advert and I was like, I, I, I really need to be part of that because I really need to grow my skills. At the end of the, the day, I want to be into independent research rather than um, institutional kind of research because I want to drive my own um, agenda mm -hmm. uh, that affects me and my community. Mm. Yeah, so um, yes, I am in vaccine research, but my target goal is to go into diagnostics. So I have been in various um, placements. I think the only close uh, diagnostic research institution that I was in was a HIV drug resistance uh, diagnostics where they were looking for um, patients who had developed resistance to certain ARV drugs in terms of HIV, but the rest were different kinds of research. I think that's the basic journey <laughs> into yeah, research. That's an extensive journey and quite some um, rich experience in various laboratories. Um, okay, so how did you, how did the idea for running your own podcast show spark? Mm. It started with this current research, actually. Mm. Um, when I was introduced into the podcast, sorry, not podcast. When I was introduced into um, ILRI research environment, I was very excited. I was, of course, I was anxious because I wasn't sure because I was coming to this big research institution and I'm not sure if I, I'll 
do my best. I, I don't know. I, I, I was just a bit anxious, but I was excited. I was very excited because I knew the kind of labs that they had. I had a tour before. I knew mm -hmm. the kind of labs they had and I knew the kind of resources that they have and the kind of training, soft skills training that they had. And I was like, I really need to be part of this. And I was so excited about that. Can you explain um, really what Ilri is? So Ilri is the International Livestock Research Institute where they concentrate on doing mostly livestock related research. Uh, though we, they are moving into One Health uh, kind of research uh, where the COVID-19 research and all that like antibiotic resistance, um, mm. things that, uh, you know, relating animals and humans, but basically it is a livestock research institute where they study um, but so, some of the things that they study is diseases, um, like the virus that you men mentioned, probably it's part of it. I don't know which virus that is actually, mm. but yeah, uh, doing looking for new interventions like vaccines, looking for new uh, farm practices, uh, trying to um, uh, help with reserving the genetic resources and all that. Like it's just anything mm -hmm. livestock, <laughs> all kinds of livestock. That's the research that they do. Mm. That's the work that they do. As so, um, part. Of, sorry. I was just going to ask, is an international institute, so it's globally connected and based in Nairobi, Kenya? Yes, so it is part of the CGIR umbrella um, where they do um, food, food security related research. Uh, there's like SIP where they do the potato and all that. But now this is the umbrella that, that does the livestock and its headquarters is in Kenya and Ethiopia. Mm. Yeah, that's how I, I found myself there. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, and now there, how did you come up with the idea for a podcast? Yeah, so um, so while I was there, I was, I was in, in spaces where I could see people walking around, people, because there are people from different backgrounds, different... Uh, different kinds of research uh, and since it's a campus it has also host other institutions so th they are very different people who are, looks very serious and they look like they know what they're doing and and I was like I'm so small here but I was like okay I think I know what I'm doing I think I've had experience uh, very short experience in different institutions so I can figure myself out here so the first time I was trying to, so um, just a brief, uh, I'm trying to create a library, uh, a mutant library for mycoplasma, uh, speci specifically the mycoplasma mycoides mm -hmm. subspecies mycoids, which, which affects cattle. And we're trying to understand the different functions of genes and also how the, the pathogen interacts with the host and we're trying to see to look for the virulence genes that cause this disease and see how we can use them as uh, as new vaccine candidates so uh, when i was creating the first part where i was creating the mutants uh, it's it's since it's a very complicated uh, uh, bacteria that is a bit different from the normal bacteria in terms of how it looks and its make uh, there, were, there are very few genetic tools for it, and the fewest that have been worked on before and uh, been successful, though not always reproducible, were the use of transposons. So, when I was, I first did my first trial with creating mutants, my first transformation, it worked. Then the second time, it was better, way better like <laughs> it yeah. was way better the third time i tried it it was okay i thought it was okay but it wasn't i just did i realized later then the fourth time i tried it it didn't work nothing fifth nothing sixth nothing i was just like oh my goodness time is going i feel i felt like i don't belong here imposter syndrome just be became amplified <laughs> <laughs> and i was like oh my goodness 
is something wrong with me. Uh -uh. I, I really, I really thought that there's something wrong, wrong with me. And I started having conversations with people because people would see me come so early and leave late and they'll be like, oh, okay. So it looks like your research is going well. <laughs> How is your research? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, no, don't mention it. Oh my goodness, like, don't even ask that question. <laughs> Can we just press the bubble? You're like, every mm -hmm. single researcher on this planet fits that way most of the time. I would, I would bet like, uh, I don't know, ten thousand dollars on on that statement. Mm. I have this, but nobody thinks other people would possibly have similar thoughts like us. I actually started thinking about the other person. Who uh, the other people who were interviewed with me, I didn't know them, of course, but I was like, if they could have picked the other person, then maybe they would have had an easier time. They would not have been wasting money on me because I am wasting money because you, you're just thinking about, about money, the money that is going down because of the mm. failed experiments. Mm. And that really ate me. And when, when people started asking me those questions, uh, I found myself saying a lot. I found myself just talking about it. And if they had time to listen, they will give their feedback and they'll tell me, you know, um, even me, sometimes my things don't work. <laughs> sometimes uh, I have to repeat something and I have to repeat something. And, and they're like, if, if you're doing something and it works, then... Um, There's something wrong. Like yeah. <laughs> Is that even research? <laughs> Seriously. Uh, can you replace sometimes with normally? <laughs> normally things don't work as expected in the laboratory. Can we just put the somewhere up on the wall? Yeah. And having these conversations with them and as in when I, I con first interact with the first two people who are open enough to talk about their research and how sometimes you run a PCR and it's just a mess or you see someone just casting out and be like, oh my goodness. And you're like, okay, so I am actually not alone here. Mm -hmm. And when you I started going for lunch, actually, I, I thought, you know, uh, I, I won't die. I, I won't kill myself. Let me interact with people. I started going for lunch and just, uh, talking to people like how, going for lunch when people are actually going for lunch so <laughs> i started talking to people and they were like um so we tried this and we tried this and this has worked sometimes you think things actually work you just hope that things people started being positive people started sharing their stories people started being vulnerable in short, but they just, it's not a word that people said. It's just that that's the state of our conversations. Mm -hmm. And I thought from there on, my life started being better, especially mentally. Not that my experiments started working or something, but my life started becoming better. And especially mentally, and I was like, I even started going back to hiking. I was like, okay. So life has actually have, has to continue. You know, if something uh, doesn't work, you know, go to the bar and drink or go to your home and, you know, talk to your kids or go hike or just do your stuff. Like, don't stop your life thinking uh -huh. that the more you do it, the more it will work. No, just go back and reflect. And I think my supervisor is one of the main uh, steerers to that. She was like, you know, just go and just do something else, like refreshing your mind and all that. So I thought this is a conversation that is not openly spoken about. People don't see how things sometimes just don't work. Mm. And they don't talk about the low side of research. They don't talk about the low side of science. They only talk about the publications they've had, the success of this, but they don't talk about how long it took for them to get there. Mm. They don't talk about it. And I think at that time, that's when I saw this documentary. I think it was then, the documentary where the, um, this uh, German researchers, the COVID-19 vaccine, the, the couple. 
Oh, uh, the one like What's the, the BioNTech. Moderna. Yeah, the BioNTech. Uh, Pfizer. I think it's Pfizer, right? Uh, Pfizer is the yeah. American firm, but BioNTech is the German one. Yes. Yeah. So that that whatever. They they That's merged. They created yeah. it. Mm. Yeah. So I was like, he. They were talking about you know the the low points. The though it was not really highlighted but i love the way they talk about their journey and you see how it came to be like it's just something that they're working for, on something else then they transfer that technology to actually use it for COVID. like yes so it was not as they were not as happy but it actually came to work uh, for everyone like for the whole world you know so it's like if we could have this kind of conversations and just talk about sometimes it's not always a good you know, walk in the park. It's not, there, there are laws that happens uh, and it affects us as human beings because we are actually humans who are doing the science. Yeah. And I thought, I wish people were more vulnerable. And I thought, why don't we have a space where there's a vulnerable scientist just talking? And that's how actually the, I named the podcast, The Vulnerable Scientist. And when I talk to different people who are not in science, um, not different, not so many people, just a few, actually two. <laughs> they were like, ah, oh, that's, that's an interesting idea. I like it. If I had this uh, vulnerable scientist, I'll be interested to hear what they have to say. <laughs> and when I asked a few of the scientists, they were like, mm, vulnerable. If you're vulnerable, you perish. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be vulnerable and survive. And I was like, oh my goodness, it crushed me. And I was like, I don't think I have scientists who can, I can interview for that. But I, then um, one day I had a tough day and I was trying to get this microscope to work. I had taken, I, I wasn't having mutants for so long such that I even forgot how the microscope, the fluorescent microscope was working. Mm -hmm. And trying to figure it out and trying to find out who, uh, trying to find the and the people who knew weren't around or they were busy or there's just something happening and I was so frustrated I couldn't get to change the microscope to show the GFP okay the, the green fluorescence I couldn't I couldn't find out which button was it and it frustrated me and it spoiled my day it really spoiled the rest of my day I I sat in that dark room and i just didn't go for lunch i just listened to youtube i, I just went away and w the whole day was ruined and i went back home and before i got home i started crying on the road and when i got home i took my mic at that time i had a mic already i took my mic I didn't, I didn't want to have a, my phone was off. I didn't want to talk, have a conversation with anyone. And I just spoke into the mic. And I felt so much better after that. And I thought, I wish other people could just come and talk. And just, just talk and just say what you're currently going through. And I thought, how can I have a place where people can, can just say, how are you? You know, and answer that question in a very vulnerable way. But I didn't know who, and I didn't want to ask my friends, and I didn't want them to feel like they have to come to be vulnerable. So I, post, I posted it. And one person came and was like, oh, I want to be on your podcast, and I want to be vulnerable also. And another asked me, what is this that you're doing? I, I would like to be vulnerable. And I thought, OK. So a scientists are actually willing to be vulnerable. So I started reaching out to other people who I was interested to talk to. And step by step, that's how <laughs> there's an episode after episode of that podcast. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. so well, that's impressive. So now you're counting 76 episodes in just four months. Like, what's your frequency? How often do you record? And like, seriously, <laughs> that's a lot of output in a short time. Oh my goodness. It, it was supposed to be a daily podcast. The intention was me to just talk about my days so that 
I can be better. Mm-hmm. It was a very selfish podcast. Mm. Then I think so far I've published like two or three that are actually personal podcasts. Mm-hmm. The rest have been, uh, it's nice to listen to people. It's nice to, to listen to what people are going through. You feel like you're, you're the one who's talked. Mm. And that's the whole idea of the podcast. For other scientists to just listen to someone else talk about their challenges of course, also their highs, because that's also being vulnerable. But having hearing someone else talk, even if you d- never want to be vulnerable on the, on the show, you become, you feel better. You feel like you're the one who's talked. Someone has told your story in a, some, you know, different kind of way. And since I was publishing people's stories, there's the editing, there's the looking for the guests, there's the, there's a lot that comes, there's the, <laughs> there's a lot that comes with editing a podcast and sometimes you, you're having a very bad day or you're so busy or you're just tired or you just don't want to listen to a very emotional story. Maybe you're just not in that space. There's this podcast that I took so much time to edit it because I didn't have the energy at that time to edit that podcast so the frequency for now it was supposed to be a daily podcast but the frequency for now is when i am ready to edit (laughs) Mm. so so far it's at at least every single day but i i try to do that but it it never it has never been perfect but it's a lot of podcasts like 15 15 podcasts per per month so far like that's the average that i've had so far or less or more depending well that's yeah that's still a high output and um yeah and and highly valuable information to share with with research around the world really can you share with us like one or two of the most compelling stories like you can also mention the speakers by name or what what are stories or situations that were shared um, with you in your podcast by people that were compelling to you were like oh I want to mention this here to also suggest our listeners to look into your podcast and or listen into other like what, what's, what's one episode that comes to mind I'm sure it's difficult to pick one or two of them. Yeah, it's it's hard to say which because <laughs> I love all these conversations that I've had that I've posted. Uh, I, I love those conversations. Of course, I've not posted everything because, you know, sometimes ca- someone can come and be so vulnerable that they're like, okay, I need to redo this when I'm not so vulnerable like this because um, they share a lot. Um, but one of the podcasts I think that stood out uh, that I think I really connected with was with Faith Zablon. Um, she had a very, very, I don't know, weird experience in, in the, you know, coming from, from, doing a master's outside then coming to Kenya and trying to get an opportunity and for over nine years you're still looking for an opportunity but you're mentoring students to get the opportunities out there or they get their PhD but you're still looking for a PhD or you're still looking for a, a space in the research community and you can't get that get your your qualified and one of the reasons is because you're a woman um it's 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 a very it was it was very emotional for me for that it was a very it's it's still a story that i still remember mm. and uh, there's, there's so much this milka story it was it's kind of the same story but a different context um oh my god I think one of the earliest stories were, were very impactful. I also loved the recent stories like Verena's story. She, she Verena Ra's story. She did, she went into her PhD 
out of spite. Someone told her, it's like, you can't do it. Why, what are you doing here? Huh. And she was like, I can prove to you that I am actually fit to do this. And she <laughs> applied for a PhD just for that, just to prove that I'm not just here to be pretty. I actually have brains and I can do this, you know. Oh, um, there's, so, there's so many, there's so many stories. I loved Fred Mobigi's story. I think that, that's the last I'll mention. Uh, so that people don't think I'm being, being choosy <laughs> about my <laughs> guests. But I, I love Fred's story. Um, I love the men that came in and became vulnerable because in the general society, we view men not being able to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And especially in the African setup, people don't believe that men should be, being vulnerable is being weak. People think that. But I love that this man came and even talked about even the moments that when they cried, when things were not working for them. Mm. And they also, and I loved that he was very specific in terms of the struggles that come with being a black researcher and the things that come with it. I really loved the way he was very honest about that because as much as uh, some of my guests are very um, nice and they want to be as vulnerable as possible. They are not in a position to, like in their current, you know, probably they're not, probably they're not in a position to do that mm. um, and mention names out loud. But someone being confident and saying something that, that is the truth. <laughs> But it's, it can be painful to other people, like it can damage maybe someone's reputation or something. But it is the truth and it's something that needs to be known. I respect that. Like, it's, it takes a lot of courage. Mm. It takes a lot of courage. And I really respect that. I respect every single guest who's come to my show and became vulnerable. And I salute them for that. That's I love that. I had to get, I had to get forty plus to realize how being vulnerable actually makes us stronger. Like, mm -hmm. I might have heard and known this before, but only now it really kicks in, and I'm working really hard on making myself vulnerable, showing my weak points, and then realizing actually that's a strength, and people admire us for it. And you get respect when you show that we're human. I mean, at the end of the day, it's just being human. Um, yeah, you're just not someone who's creating weird stuff yeah. in the lab, or you're not like someone who, as in, it's the authenticity and the honesty that I love, um, that drives me actually. Um, pers I have a personality where I'm still looking to find a way how I can deal with, you know, um, dishonesty because the, the world is full of a lot of dishonesty around us. So I'm still struggling with that. So I'm, I'm driven by honesty and I love that. And it's one of the drivers of this podcast, just being honest, true self and just bearing, just letting yourself out and just talk about things as they come. Because just so you know that I don't ask questions before I don't send questions. There are no questions that I sent to my guests before. Yeah. Most of the time I even don't know those. <laughs> I've never interacted with the guest before. I've never, it's just an honest conversation that I just have with the guest. Yeah. And it's just the most, I, I love that. My close natural. Not the, yes, it's not the, the common media um media way of doing this, but it's what I love. And I, I'm sure that there are listeners who love that. <laughs> Could have been people who regret it to have been on record with making themselves vulnerable and asking not to publish it? Yes. Um, yes. Um, yes, I'll say yes. <laughs> I'll just say yes. <laughs> yeah, no, that's okay. I don't want to dig any further. And that, it's good that it's possible. I mean, it's not that they sign a contract, whatever they say. No, no. 
sometimes um for me it's important it, i don't get like annoyed that you've wasted my time no because sometimes just having that conversation it's there's so much you learn from people's stories and what they have to share and that's enough for me uh, and since i'm not selfish that's why i actually share it but that's usually enough and it's actually good for the them the guests who come in and just share the stories and answer the questions that no one sometimes have has ever asked them <laughs> they just ask them about their research and what is this that you're doing they don't really care about the story um so i them coming in and you know answering questions that they never even thought about sometimes is 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 a good thing i've always asked every single guest off or on record how do you feel after having this conversation that's mm -hmm. a very common question that i ask and an and important one also yes mm -hmm. a very important one because you don't want to to leave someone worse than you left them you want to leave someone better it's not like you just took and took you yeah. want to give so that i love the, the responses <laughs> i really love the responses that they have and i respect when someone says can we repeat yeah. this and i know that probably they got to a point where they felt oh my goodness that's a lot <laughs> <laughs> let me come again all the time like give me a break myself <laughs> yeah they're like um i i think i need to because mm. not everybody's ready to for for their story to be public about certain things that mm. they share and sometimes sometimes i'll get people who'd um would say i'll sometimes someone will ask me to send them the recording so that i can edit a part that they would like out or i can edit a name just a name of something but re maintain the story mm -hmm. i get that and i respect that mm -hmm. it's okay like it's okay for someone to say at this moment i don't want this to be out oh. yet yes yeah and there's nothing uh dishonest about that it's just they're choosing <laughs> but then there's still the option of of sending an email at some point showing sarah what we recorded last year now's the time let it fly or before i started this podcast um i had tried another podcast that's mm -hmm. why i had the mic and it was just chat with a young scientist I didn't know I, when I, I hadn't thought about it through it's just I just wanted to have conversations with people and write about them or edit post them I, I hadn't thought it through I had actually I had a lot of conversations that I really never put out there and I was still trying to figure out how do you ask questions what kind of stories are relevant um, though I thought I later on I discovered all of them are relevant actually uh and one of them i i really love the story and i posted it. it was one of the stories that i posted and the things that they talked about you know mentioning things data some data related stuff that they mentioned someone came to them one of the bosses and like um you need to delete this part or you need you need you shouldn't have talked about this and i had to since deleting the parts that the, she had said were not it will, it will just make i don't know at that sp at that time i didn't have that energy to just delete the important parts of the story mm -hmm. and and remain with the other part i was like okay let's just redo this actually we've tried to redo it but it just never worked but that has happened before just to say that uh, that has happened though not on the vulnerable scientist podcast but that has happened before where someone mentioned something uh, and they need that to be taken down mm. and i took it down <laughs> yeah yeah but you know when you share something online it remains online you know in some sort of way though it's yeah. not longer online but in some uh -huh. sort of ways it's always online 
I said also the other way when somebody said, can you not yet release this, but maybe next year when I'm done with my thesis. Without, um, I mean, I'm not talking about somebody wanting to blackmail somebody else, but just because they're still in the middle of it and they didn't process it quite, so they need some distance to it. Yeah, okay, so that has never happened so far, but what has happened is when I approach someone and they're like, uh, I'm not in the right, I would really love to do that and you'll see that they really want to, but not now, maybe in terms of where they're working or what they're currently going through or they're busy or they're, what they're currently working on, they don't want to probably talk about it. Or it's just, it happens before. It's, it has never happened after, like someone telling me to post mm. on a okay. recording. Yeah. Yeah, I also get the response, oh, yeah, let's do a podcast, but just not now because I have so much work or <laughs> something. Yeah. Or I'm not ready or I don't have a topic to talk about. Or Yeah. Great. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share about the work that you do? Or maybe, and maybe to conclude with what's next? Like, is, do you have like a threshold that like to hit 100 episodes and then off to the next topic or off to a new chapter? Or is the vulnerable scientist going to stay with us for some time? And people can sign up to be interviewed by you. Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I used to think I was alone, that I get to a point where I'm like, why am I doing this? I should quit. I feel like I'm quitting. I should just leave this thing alone. And I actually realized just a few hours ago that I'm actually not alone in that. The podcasters who are very passionate about the, what they do, science communication, but sometimes you get those those moments yes i've had those moments um and no i'm not planning to quit uh, i still want to do this for as long as i live um or, or as long as i have energy to do that no. because there's so much um, energy that listening to people can take from you and that's why uh, it's hard to always record i want to talk but and listen, but sometimes you're not in a headspace to listen to a story. You're not mentally um, in that space. Mm. Um, the initial idea of the Vulnerable Scientist podcast was to have a How Are You um, podcast or episodes where people can just come in and just talk about the day and that's it. Um, but asking someone, how are you? People always say good and mm -hmm. they probe further and they still say, yeah, I'm good. They probe further, it's still the same answer. Can I just few inter intervene here and say, if you ask a German, how are you? You will get the full answer. And you embrace yourself for a monologue <laughs> because you get the full picture of what's going on in their lives. <laughs> But, but, it's all yeah. Yeah, um, but it's different here like um, but really because when i go to kenya and you are in line for the cashier in the supermarket people have conversations and usually it starts with how are you and then mm -hmm. the whole family story is like oh and this niece got married and this happened and then that and then you know for started. that at least those people know each other like they oh. have some they have a base to talk about but for someone to just meet me as a stranger who <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. each other, it's, well, it's okay. very hard. Yeah, it's very hard for them to just answer that answer. And most people actually don't know how to answer that answer because no one has ever, most people don't really ask that question with the intention of really knowing how are you? It's just a greeting, how about Riyako? <laughs> it's just a normal greeting. So yeah. uh, I thought, let me first get an acquaintance with these different people by knowing the stories. And that is just having an issue of just talking about the highs and lows mm -hmm. only. Just talking about how I, how, 
what are the things that you've experienced throughout your journey, the highs and the lows. Because as much as we talk about the, lo the lows, uh, vulnerability for me, I believe, is also talking about the highs, mm -hmm. like talking about the joys, talking about the emotions that come with everything to do with your career and those and all, all emotions, all, the sadness, the anxiety, the uh, happiness, excitement, the joy, everything, everything that comes with it. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's how I believe um, what uh, being vulnerable means. Um, mm -hmm. It has been a loss. But now I am moving to an episode where now I can I bring in the previous uh, guest or the few guests who I've gotten who are able to answer mm -hmm. that question. And I put it as a season, just how are you just talking about typically your day and just talking about what has happened and that's it mm. <laughs> yeah so um yeah that's that's the next phase of the interview uh mm -hmm. the interview of the podcast that i am working on right now the casualty um, of research no way yes 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 just talking about not no need to explain anything no need to explain <laughs> what is jeans <laughs> just come and just talk mm -hmm. when i was starting when i was starting to have mental uh deep men deeper mental issues when it came to my research um i tried to reach out to a therapist and when lamenting about all these things they really didn't understand what i'm saying and <laughs> i was like i really i felt misunderstood it's not like i'm discouraging anyone from you know visiting a therapist because there's so many things you can talk about and there are other therapists who are, can actually understand what you're saying they actually people who are not in science who actually understand they take their time to understand mm -hmm. um mm. but i just my first encounter was not uh of course that's not i don't know how therapy is but for me i don't know what i was expecting that's what i was expecting in my head like just talk to someone who is not necessarily my friend who will not necessarily cover we'll just listen just listen um and i couldn't find that and i i think i would like people to do that oh, uh, either offline or online mm -hmm. on the podcast like those are the i think so, one of the services that i want to, i'm not a therapist but i would like just to listen and just say nothing but just hear someone just lament about the day and yeah feel good after that i always feel good after ranting so i'm assuming <laughs> that a lot of people feel good after ranting like, seriously i think you're filling a void here like this is such a maybe that's what some scientists manage to do during lunch breaks i don't mm -hmm. see many as you said earlier like usually it's about success stories maybe some little struggle but they certainly don't lift the lid to the the dark episodes of everybody's experiences mm. um yeah i mean yeah there's also i've come across also um i've had previous episodes um two by now one is to be released soon with or will be released by the time this one is released um with a friend and colleague javangari and she's also into um, mental health and academia. So she's um, also a, a researcher in psychology and she specializes in, so, in all kinds of working groups and organizations, associations for mental health and, and for researchers. Mm. And I think, like, and I've also had my depressive episodes and my anxiety moments, like many of us do. And I've discovered, uh, Remo is also a research for mental health organization or research for mental health organization. Um, yeah, so there, there's, luckily there's a lot of or increasing amount of conversations around mental health issues and mental health, um, like how to preserve mental health as a researcher. It's, it's sad that we have to talk about this, but maybe it's also about I, like like I said, I think you're filling a void because what we need to have is more honest conversations 
about what it means to do research that is quite frustrating most of the time and some people joke about it but then to actually walk through it is another story yeah and i think it can prevent a lot of people having to go and see a therapist who very unlikely understand what we are working um through and and yeah experiencing day in and day out with the pressure and expectation by ourselves i think that's what put most pressure on me was my own expectation mm. um yeah and and that's also what helped me the most when i realized that hey, the other phd students in my program hey they have the same fears they have the same thoughts they have the same mm. soft doubts and whereas coming together and finally towards the end of my phd speaking up what's happening made me be like what oh it's not so bad after all like like what you explained earlier so yeah, please continue having these conversations with, with the guests. And, um, and I think it will inspire, or for sure will inspire many other young and also senior researchers. You know, what people don't know, um, when, I, when I have uh, the conversations on record, there's, if it's two hours, there's probably three hours that is not put out there because it was off record like mm. it was intentionally off record just finish mm -hmm. maybe before starting your podcast you just have a conversation or which is very rare but after finishing the conversation we talk a lot and talk and talk and, and people feel good after that and i think i have come to uh, to recognize that i think i'm a good listener uh i'm not a perfect listener but i think i'm a good listener and if like I who's the judge here? We're not saying not perfect. Nobody's judging. Yeah. Just say good yes. listener. What's up? <laughs> yeah, uh, I I am a good listener, and I thought, why don't I use that gift to help someone? Because sometimes people want to talk. Uh, they want to talk, but they're not ready to talk on record. Mm. So why don't I, I always open that door? Like, just come. Let's just talk. You do want to talk? Just let's just talk, because I feel like you want to talk, but not now on record. But let's just talk, or maybe you really never want to talk on record. Let's talk. That happens too. Like mm -hmm. they really don't want to be on record, but they want to talk. So we talk, right. and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great final statement. And please continue with the great work you're doing. Well, I'm sure you will. So get what I ask. <laughs> um, and I'm, curious, yeah, I'm looking forward to the next episodes that are coming up on your show. It's quite, well, we put the link in the show notes, um, www.saranyankeri.co.ke for Kenya and slash the vulnerable scientist podcast, all in one word. And that's where you find all the Currently 76, by the time you hear this, probably up to 100, maybe close to. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, explore, listen in, and thanks for being on the show. I want to add something. Sure, go ahead. Um, I'm thinking of adding a website where all the information that has been on the podcast can be either written or posted there or any other services that will be offered in relation to the podcast will also be posted there or a kind of database of the scientists and what they are doing and profiles of the scientists that I have interviewed will be there. Cool. And also some of the resources that are being shared during the conversation, right? Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. yeah, I think this is a huge resource of knowledge and also um, to seek assistance if, if some of us feel low sometimes. There's always a hand to reach out to, to pull you up again. Santisana, speak soon. Thank you so much. Okay.